the theory of evolution tells us that space and time are not fundamental. They're more like a headset, a virtual reality headset that lets us play the game of life. So how does one go about solving the hard problem of consciousness? Well, so most of my good friends and colleagues who are studying the hard problem of consciousness are physicalists. They assume that space and time are fundamental and that objects inside space and time, like the, um, the elementary particles of the standard model of physics, the, the, the bosons, leptons, and quarks, for example, are fundamental um, parts of reality. And then any objects that are made out of them are part of reality as well. So protons, neutrons, and neurons and brains. So that's, they start with space time and physical objects in space time as the fundamental reality and assume that life and consciousness are latecomers, uh, that the universe began in the Big Bang, there was no life, there was no consciousness, and it took millions, billions of years for life to emerge, and then who knows how much longer after that for consciousness to emerge. That's, that's the standard story. And so for them, the question is, how do physical systems such as brains or maybe artificial intelligences give rise to consciousness. And my attitude is that that whole framework um, is missing the results of our best scientific theories, namely evolution by natural selection on the one hand, and also quantum field theory and, and Einstein's theory of gravity, both of which tell us that space time is doomed. That space time has been assumed to be fundamental for centuries, of space and time, and then space time more recently, has been assumed to be fundamental and has been a wonderful framework, but our best theories tell us it's over, that that framework is, is not fundamental and we need to find some new mathematically precise, um, more fundamental ideas uh, outside of space time. So space time is doomed. That's, that's what um, physicists like um, Nima Arkani Hamed and David Gross are saying uh, about space time. So these are the, the these are the uh, you know the, the experts who are studying space time, and they're the ones that are pronouncing its death, um, and therefore the death of objects inside space time. And the work that I've been doing just agrees. It says that evolution of natural selection agrees with the physicists that space time, even though it's tacitly assumed in the way that you know, Darwin even thought about evolution, when you look at the mathematics of evolutionary theory, it it, it agrees that um, that tacit assumption um, is false and that the theory of evolution tells us that space and time are not fundamental. They're more like a headset, a virtual reality headset that lets us play the game of life. So when evolution by natural selection and quantum field theory with Einstein's gravity both tell us that space and time and objects in space and time are not fundamental, then my attitude is we should go with the best science. And, th and that means that a theory of consciousness which tries to boot up consciousness from physical systems is doomed to fail. It's doomed to fail because our best science tells us that space time itself is doomed. So we cannot hope, it would be for example, like someone trying to, to build a space program um, on the assumption that the earth is flat. Uh, well, as soon as you find out the earth is not flat, you, you need new assumptions to, to, to build your space program. That's just not the way you want it to, to go. So it was, so my colleagues and friends who are working on this, it was a wonderful assumption. It was reasonable to start with, with neurons, for example, or artificial intelligence circuits and so forth, before we discovered that space-time is not fundamental. Now that we know space-time is not fundamental, um, <clears throat> we're wasting our time. Well, it's not a complete waste of time because you'll learn a lot even by you know, starting off with mistaken foundation, but ultimately you won't, you won't succeed. You will not be able to start with flat earth or space and time and boot up a theory of consciousness. So, so my attitude is we need to, to rethink from the, the ground up. Of course, I'm all for neuroscience. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist myself, so I'm not saying that brains are irrelevant. We, we need to study neural activity and we need to study artificial intelligences, but, but we have to study them in a very, very different way. Um, evolution tells us that what we're seeing is just an interface. It's, it's there to guide adaptive behavior, <clears throat> period, not to tell us the truth. So when we look inside brains and we see neurons and, and neural circuits, we're seeing something that's very important for us to understand, but it's just an interface. It's not, it's an interface description, it's not the truth. So, so, we, we, so neuroscience is gonna be far more difficult than, than we thought. We're, we're gonna need more money for neuroscience because 
we look through microscopes and we see neurons and synapses and so forth and, and networks. Um, and we thought that that's all we had to deal with. No, that's just the surface of what we have to deal with. The, the reality behind that is also something we're, we're going to have to deal with. We'll have to reverse engineer neurons and neural networks and so forth. So, so, so the short answer is, we, we, I don't think we can start with any objects inside space and time and boot up consciousness. Although the only clues we have are inside space and time. And so we have to study, for example, cognitive neuroscience, but we have to reverse engineer it and find structures beyond space and time that would allow us to boot up a, a theory of consciousness. So, so you can see um, the, the game just got a lot harder and, and far more interesting. So long answer to your question. Sure. What's the difference between reality and fundamentality? Well, so <clears throat> I think the physicist would say that, um, for example, space time is not fundamental because it has no operational meaning below what's called the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So, so that, that means that it's not for a scientist is not a deep enough framework for us to build our theories on. Now, so that that by itself would preclude it being a fundamental reality, right? So, you know, we're of course in the hunt for reality in some sense um, in, in, in science, uh, but each scientific theory can only make certain assumptions. It has to start with certain assumptions and then try to explain what it can based on those assumptions. So the assumption that space and time and objects in space and time is fundamental um, turns out not to be a, a good set of assumptions and, and therefore not a candidate for the objective reality. Now, it, it could be um, reality, quote unquote, in some lesser sense, in, in the sense that it could be um, we have a real experiential perception of space and time and a real experiential perception of, of objects in space and time. So they could be real as our particular experiences, as, as our particular interface, um, but they're not real in a more fundamental sense as being, um, so, so I'll use the word real in two different senses. And I think that it's important to distinguish them. One sense of real is something is real if it exists and has all of its properties even if it's never observed. So something is real in that, uh, I'll call that an objective sense, if it uh, exists with its properties, even when it's not observed. And so space-time is not objective in that sense. We, we thought it was, but it's not. But there's another sense of real. And that is, uh, I might say, look, I've got a headache. And um, that headache only exists because I perceive it. It wouldn't exist if I didn't perceive it. But if you want to tell me it's not real, I would be very cross with you because it's a, it's a painful headache. So, so you can see there's another sense of real where you'd say something is real if it's a real experience, even if that experience uh, only exists as, as long as it's being experienced by, by someone. So there's two senses of real, real in the objective sense and real in this subjective sense. And of course, scientists um, have been trying to find a reality in an objective sense. Um, and so space-time is not objective reality. Um, and evolution suggests that it's just a subjective experience and, and not objective reality. Now, does all emergent space-time theories suggest that space-time is not objective? Um, because it's a different claim to say it's objective versus it's not fundamental. Sorry, it's not objective versus it's not fundamental. Right. So, so for physicists, when, when they say that space-time is doomed, they're saying it's not fundamental. And uh, yeah, I don't know what, what, they, what they would say about this objective versus subjective kind of thing. Uh, so I don't know what the physicists would say about that. Might, you know, they, they might say, well, let me think about that. Uh, you know, I, for us, it's just not fundamental. And, and you know, so for us, it's not, it's not real in the sense that we need you know, for our theories of reality. And, and they, they may not ter be terribly interested in the subjective versus objective distinction. For, for us in the cognitive neurosciences, it's a pretty important distinction to make because we study subjective experience as well as what we think might be objective realities. So, so yeah, I don't know what the physicists would say about, the, about that. Um, <laughs> Sure. What is it about the amplitude hedron that attracts you to it more so than, so, let's say, some other approaches to emergent space time or quantum gravity? Right. So, so the amplitude hedron is is a, a structure that Nimar Khani Hamed 
Yaroslav Trinka and others have been working on, uh, but uh, Trinka and, and, and uh, Nima, uh, Yaroslav Trinka and, and Nima Arkani Hamed were the ones who uh, published the paper, I think, in 2014. So this is only less than 10 years old, uh, the, this, this, this discovery. It's, it's a structure entirely outside of space time and entirely prior to quantum theory. So it, it, it's, it's, it's outside of both space time and quantum theory. And they argue that space time and quantum theory um, will emerge together from these deeper structures like the amplitudehedron. And, and the reason I, I think that I pro, uh, really like their approach opposed to some others is that they, they really jump with both feet beyond space and time. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't go halfway on this. It's, it's not just that space is not fundamental. It's also that time is not fundamental. And really that quantum theory is not fundamental. And so, so attempts to, to try to go halfway where you say, well, let's, let's, let's make time fundamental or, or let's make particles fundamental and we'll use uh, you know, some kind of entanglement to try to boot up you know, a structure of space from particles. Uh, th those just are not serious enough. You, you really have to jump entirely outside of space and time and particles. And, and the reason why you have to let go of the particles and you can't just boot up space time from entanglement of particles is that elementary particles the you know the the, the bosons leptons and quarks are the standard theory of, of, of particle physics those what are those particles they're what they call irreducible representations of the poincare group which is the group of symmetries of space time in other words the elementary particles just are symmetries of space time so if you're trying to get a, a new fundamental basis for booting up space time. It's not particles because those particles are defined in terms of symmetries of space time itself. So, so what I like about the amplitudehedron and, <clears throat> and the deeper structure. So beyond the amplitudehedron, they found these things called decorated permutations. But that's sort of the, the deepest and biggest, most surprising structure they found. And these structures, um, what, what, what I like about them is they go entirely beyond space and time and the elementary particles, which is the kind of bold leap we need for our next step. Halfway won't work. It's, it's just like you, you just have to go all the way, or if you don't swim out into the ocean, if you just stay on the shore, you'll never get there. You've got to jump away from the shore and really go out there beyond space and time. Where do the fitness functions come from? So that, re that requires me to say a little bit about our approach, um, which is about sure. consciousness being fundamental, right? So, Great. So the physicists, so I should say, you know, what we're doing and what the physicists have done and how it's related, uh, what's beyond space time. So the physicists are looking for mathematical structures beyond space time that would allow them to do things like compute the probabilities of particle interactions at, at colliders like the Large Hadron Collider. So you want something that's going to be mathematically precise and rigorous outside of space and time that allows you to boot up the structures of space and time, you know, Lorentz invariants and things like that, uh, or quantum gravity. And they, you also want to be able to compute fundamental things like so-called scattering amplitudes, the probability that two gluons smash into each other and four gluons spray out in a certain way. So. So they're finding structures like the amplitudehedron and decorated permutations, which let them do that. But they have no dynamics beyond space-time. These are static structures beyond space-time. And physics typically likes to find some kind of dynamical theory. And so what I'm doing with, with my collaborators, um, Chetan Prakash, Manish Singh, and, and uh, Robert Prentner, and, and, and many others, uh, is we're, we've got a mathematical model of consciousness um, being fundamental and beyond space-time. And why we do that, we can, we can go into that later on if you want, why, why we start there. But, but the idea is that consciousness is fundamental and, and it's a dynamical system of consciousness. It's like a social network, an interacting network uh, like the Twitterverse, where there's lots of you know, agents that are um, communicating with other agents, tweeting and following and the whole bit. That's sort of a, a good intuitive model of it. And our paper that was just published today, Fusions of Consciousness, goes into the mathematics. So people can, who are interested, you know, there's a paper that's, if you just Google Fusions of Consciousness in my name, you can see the paper that just came out today that goes into this, um, into the mathematics. But so we have this uh, mathematical model of consciousness in which consciousness is fundamental. And our goal is to show that space and time 
are not fundamental, as the physicists say, and that they arise as merely a user interface, that conscious agents, some conscious agents use space and time as a, a way to, um, to facilitate their interactions with other conscious agents. So they, space and time is just a user interface. So for us to do that, um, we have to show how precisely space and time and the standard model of physics and so forth um, arise um, from a dynamics of conscious agents. Right? So we have, we have a lot of work to do. We have to say, okay, here's our mathematical model of consciousness. It's not just a hand wave. We're not saying, wouldn't it be nice if consciousness is fundamental? We're saying, here's our precise mathematical model of consciousness. And now we have to say, here's precisely how we compute scattering amplitudes in space-time based on our model, because we now have this mapping from a conscious agent dynamics into space-time. So that's what this paper, Fusions of Consciousness, is setting out to do, is to... Is, mapping from con uh, dynamics of consciousness into space-time. And the fun part of it is what we decided to do was, hey, the physicists have already gone outside of space-time. They found these deep structures like decorated permutations beyond space-time. So what we need to do, because what they've shown is if you can give us decorated permutations, we can take you all the way back into space-time and we can compute scattering amplitudes. So we said, okay, great, you've already done most of the heavy lifting. All we need to do is take our theory of consciousness and show how decorated permutations are a simple model or a simple projection of our theory of conscious agents. So that's what this paper does. What we, we actually set out to do that and we did it. We, we showed how to take our Markovian dynamics of conscious agents, project it into decorated permutations. And by the way, that was apparently that was a new mathematical contribution. Um, it, we were the first, as far as I know, to have a, a general theory of how you take a Markov chain and canonically uh, associate with it a decorated permutation. So having done that, um, we then um, have this mapping in principle all the way from a theory of conscious agents through decorated permutations, through all the structures that the physicists have found into space time. So, so, so now what we're, so one, one thing we learned from doing that is we now know what feature of our Markovian dynamics is critical to this to the connection with with particle physics. 